my uh, talk called Simple Modern Java Microservices in the Cloud. Uh, my name is Andrzej Grzesikow. You see, this is the best uh, conference that you're going to attend today. It's the J Champions Conference, which is short for Java Champions Conference. And what can I say? I can mute my YouTube because I wanted to make sure that it works. And so, uh, yeah, the talk is called like this. And this is the 680th day on the, of the pandemic. I hope it all goes away and we can go back to operating at a normal level. Uh, too long didn't read. If you're very early in your time zones or you're very late in your time zones or you are very busy with anything, uh, the gist of the presentation is uh, if you have a lot of services, then the complexity is going to be hard enough and the business complexity of each, of each and every one of them is going to be also hard enough. So limit the number of moving things, make it make life simpler for you. And then going to the cloud with microservices will be a bit easier. Also, uh, the mandatory part is the introduction. Well, my name is Andrzej Grzesik, but I do not expect uh, most of you to be able to pronounce that, which means I go by X like lags or axe, as in the Lord of the Rings, uh, weapon of, uh, of the dwarves. I have a Twitter, I have an email. I also work at Revolt as a principal backend engineer. And uh, that means that if you'd like to know anything more about me, uh, as in those are the icons that I usually put uh, on the slide. I run a conference. Uh, I also am involved in Polish Java user group, a software craftsmanship Krakow, or used to be, because I live in London and have been for the past nine years. And uh, if you have any questions about the talk, uh, reach out, write them in the chat. We have an amazing moderator, Anna, who I would like to thank you, uh, say thanks to a lot, because she woke up very early in her time zone just to help this uh, thing happen. Obviously, I'd like to uh, say thanks to everybody else involved in the conference. So if there are any questions, uh, She's going to pass them to me. I will try to answer them as I see them. So if you have any questions, ask them, and I'll try to react. If I don't see them, uh, because this uh, amazing event has this ability, I can actually stay a few minutes after the talk and uh, go through the questions as they are there. So I'll scroll through the YouTube chat, and if YouTube doesn't break, we'll, we'll get you sorted. If you have any questions about Revolut, uh, we just drop me an email and uh, I'll be happy to talk about today is about the talk and uh, making uh, services with Java and microservices, microservices in Java and not succumbing under the weight. Now, obviously, Revolt is hiring like most of the comp uh, technology companies out there. Now, obviously, because I work for a company and I've used the corporate logo, my opinions and all of the facts presented here are my interpretation. If I'm wrong, then I can only say I'm sorry. It was never my intention to mislead you, but uh, treat everything I say with a pinch of salt because I'm I'm a human and humans make mistakes. Now, I also like dry jokes and I like dry pictures or pictures that uh, contain dry jokes. And that's mostly a reminder for me that I need to drink something. You're welcome to laugh at the same time, of course. And the topic of the uh, talk today is modern Java microservices in the cloud. Uh, well, uh, if anybody says bingo, uh, you win. Uh, the second person doesn't, sorry. Uh, but the first thing that we have to think about is what is it that actually makes a service modern? Because that's the big question. Java is obvious, microservices, I think the term is well known enough. Whereas modern in terms of software development, as in the, the, the domain has is, is only what? 80 years old, we, we probably still haven't figured it out fully if we keep talking about, well, modern things. So is it being able to run software the, 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 without the bloat? Or have you ever imagined, have you ever dreamt of writing the software, working with software without the bloat? So most of you probably believe that code quality matters. Those of you who have uh, dealt with what people would attribute uh, the word bad to, so bad legacy, uh, unmaintained uh, code bases, well, you know that code quality actually matters a lot. Those of you who have fixed uh, bugs in, in, in software in crazy places, you know that the code quality actually matters uh, a lot. Now, can you imagine how well, how quickly you could uh, make things if uh, you wanted to write the best code possible, if the services that you work with were very easy to work with? Well, to me, this is actually what modern is, is, is about, so that the concepts in the services and uh, the way the software is written makes it easy to work with the software. The problem, uh, one problem with that attitude is uh, interpretations of what makes it 
modern differs. And also we as software or technology people, instead of talking about the attitude and how we do the, do the work, we actually go to the easier subjects. We talk about technology and associate modern, not with attitude, not with the architecture, but with the libraries used, with the versions of libraries used. And it's a perfectly valid argument when you talk about uh, logging and uh, the, the log4j uh, thing that everybody probably was uh, busy with uh, in December. But apart from that, those libraries, they matter a bit less than, than how we use them. So is the language that we write the software in a factor of modern? Well, if we just use, uh, and then it really depends on, on, on who you ask. If you ask me, I'm going to say I'm going to default with, with Java and I keep using Java and I like the language, even though some people will say it's a bit bloated. Some people will say it's a bit verbose. Yes, but it's also very, it's also usually very precise. And that means that there is little for interpretation about how it's going to work. If I need more power, I personally choose to use Scala uh, because that gives me the amount of power I like. Uh, and on the JVM, I usually feel satisfied. This does not mean that uh, other languages are not are not great and you shouldn't use them. It's just, those are my personal preferences. Basically, choosing the, the language doesn't make a service modern because if, if it did, if that was the thing, then you would have to switch your language and rewrite everything to a new language so that you keep things being modern. And I can perfectly imagine, I have worked with modern code bases that they were dating back to something uh, like, well, five plus years uh, or more. And remember, Java is uh, 25 about uh, over 25 so that's 20 percent of the age of the language so it's probably not the language but since we're talking about modern java services we are going to focus on java and we're going to focus on the gabm obviously is it the framework is the framework what decides that our microservice that our service stack is modern can you imagine doing a modern application in spring most likely yes can you imagine doing it in quarkus Yes, most likely. Can you imagine doing it with uh, any of uh, microprofile in, uh, implementations? Absolutely. Can you imagine doing it in any other? Yes, as well. So the conclusion is fract the framework itself is probably not the deciding factor. And if you pick a very obscure, very old and unmaintained framework as the foundation for your application, then probably you're not going to be modern or it will be hard, but that's not the deciding factor. Let's keep moving. Is it the database? Is it how you store your data? That's going to be the deciding factor whether you are writing a modern application. Well, you know where I'm getting with it. It's, it really depends. Uh, so SQL, no SQL, back to SQL. Uh, uh, pick whatever works for you, but this is not going uh, to this be the deciding factor whether you are writing a modern application. There is a lot of modern internet startups that use uh, Postgres, that use MySQL. There is a lot of uh, successful companies that use Cassandra. There is a lot of successful uh, enterprises there that use, uh, for example, MongoDB. There is a lot of things that use uh, Kafka. And there is probably an a comparable number of unsuccessful endeavors that have used any of those technologies uh, in the past. And I would risk saying that it wasn't their choice of the data store that led to their lack of success. So the conclusion is, it's not the database. What about architecture? Is it how we build the software a factor? Yes, actually architecture is part of the problem and architecture is what matters, but we're going to cover it a bit, a bit later. But before we go there, for us as software people, is it in the test? Yes, it is in the test. Everybody always says that we should have written more tests. Every time you fix a bug, most likely you will going to say, I wish I, I, I wrote a test that covered this. I wish I wrote more tests about this, uh, which means tests are definitely one of the modern elements. And it's funny because JUnit is, uh, again, quite a dated library. It's not. It has not been created within the past five years for sure. Uh, my favorite mocking library, Mokito. This is again, not the most recent discovery or development. Uh, the library obviously uh, keeps being developed and maintained, but I keep using it because it's very useful and I cannot imagine writing working on any modern project without good testing infrastructure. 
that's that's definitely a given. And then some people might say, hey, if I want to do a modern application, I want to use, I need to use Kotlin, I need to use Kafka, and I need to use Kubernetes. And it might be that their use case actually perfectly warrants and per perfectly explains uh, those three technologies. But similarly to what used to happen in the Java space a couple of years ago, well, more than 10 actually, uh, where people would say, oh, we're going to do a project. So we're going to use uh, Spring and Hibernate without even knowing what the project is going to do. Uh, now, people, some people, have to have those uh, have the similar uh, view in terms of those technologies. They want to use them even without knowing what they are going to solve and if those technologies are even applicable. So, if you want to choose technologies before knowing what your project uh, is, and you go for the three uh, those three on the picture, then you are going for a three K apocalypse. But if you've used them, if you've chosen them uh, for a reason, then obviously the apocalypse is uh, only a bit sarcastic uh, attitudes to have. But basically, the bottom line is choose your tools according to the problem. Do not choose the tools before you know the problem because, well, because adding new technology and complexity associated with that to a new business problem is a recipe for, well, fill in disaster in your own language and fill in as many adjectives as you require. There is enough complexity in a new business problem that you as software people do not fully understand that adding new technology on top of that is probably making it much harder than it has to be. If you, if you can use techno technology and, or a set of libraries, set, set of tools that you already are very familiar with that will make you more productive uh, and just to focus on the business problem so that you can deal with the business problem well, then you have bigger, better chances of a success. And this is what we are after, because uh, making a project that doesn't work is probably not what anybody is interested. So what makes a service modern? Well, the opposition is uh, legacy. And the, the question that you, somebody uh, might ask, hey, but is there anything wrong with legacy? And I will say that I do not have a problem with legacy projects. I would say that they give a very useful frame of reference that not too many of the modern or newly started projects can can enjoy and entertain to have. But there is one there is one uh, aspect of legacy that we as software people, especially in projects that are going to live for a longer time, should be afraid of. And this is something called calcification. And calcification, according to the Wikipedia uh, definition, is the accumulation of calcium in body tissue. I'm just reading, so you don't have to read it. Uh, what did what did the consequence uh, of that is? And uh, just so that you know, I have not studied biology. This was not my uh, a subject I paid great uh, attention to. So if I misrepresent something and you know it uh, this area better, I can only apologize for misrepresenting. But basically, it makes moving much harder and evolving and uh, changing anything in, 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 in bodies harder. Uh, the same effect I have seen time and again, time and again in software. If software uses too many, uh, too many uh, let's call them for now special effects or magic, then it is bound to calcification. And calcification is probably one of the biggest dangers in software that we have to avoid because if the software calcifies, if we let it happen, then the software is going to become everything but modern. And let's have a short journey back in time. First, obviously, we have to accelerate to a speed of, you know what, how many miles per hour. Uh, first of all, there was uh, the year never, Big Bang. Uh, some people say it never happened. Some people say that there are alternative uh, versions uh, of how the world began. I have no idea. I wasn't around. Easy for me to say. Uh, also, this is not the time uh, that we need to consider. The year that we need to consider is 1997. Something called uh, EJBs. And uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about, good for you. If you know what I'm talking about, you know what I'm talking about. And you probably are already all grimacing. Uh, the idea of EJBs was a very sound one. It uh, comes from IBM, and it actually made sense when it was uh, designed. Uh, it solved a problem in a specific case, in a specific uh, situation. Then in year 1999, we got in, we in Java received something that uh, now we would consider a bit of a dated API, which is server specification. 
uh, the interpretation of that, the consequences, basically, it was possible to make a web application using the Java platform. And then came year 2001. First of all, I promised pictures. And that, uh, apart from the Space Odyssey, we also got EJB uh, 2.0. 2.0 was progress above EJB1 because uh, they allowed local access, so you didn't always have to go through RMI to call anything, which meant it was faster, but also it was terrible or worse than terrible because it used something that used to be called Xdoclet. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, just remember it was bad. And everybody was very happy to learn about the new thing, the new and amazing thing that was announced according to a uh, reading I did, because I was trying to associate the dates with uh, something called Spring Framework in version 0 0.9, which came to be because EJBs were too complex. So the answer to a complex technology is a new technology that is supposed to con conquer uh, and uh, convey much more simplicity and make it easier for us to make modern software. So there is a trend. Modern means simpler. Uh, then what happened in 2005, everybody started using AJAX. And AJAX, as, as you all know, stands for asynchronous JavaScript and JSON. Uh, then in year 2006, a specification of EJB 3.0 uh, came, uh, came to exist. And why did EJB 3.0 came to exist? Well, the, one of the inputs was uh, obviously the existence of Spring and the developments in the uh, software thought that was were made possible because of Spring, uh, but primarily because uh, the, the root cause was because original EJB was too complex. And then in year 2014 happened Spring Boot. Spring Boot was a very nice uh, change to the Spring framework. And I find it also a bit funny because one of the benefits of using Spring Boot, uh, as uh, explained by uh, some people, is because the basic Spring framework was getting a bit too complex. So again, uh, the irony, uh, the framework that, that came to be so that it can be simpler became too complex, so a new framework came to be. Uh, this is still uh, a case, as in some people uh, still interpret uh, it now the other way, that Java EE is definitely the, the, the smaller, well, more better thought uh, through API, 10 times smaller than Spring. This is not my opinion. This is just a loose translation from a comment under a YouTube video. But I found it quite funny uh, to show how uh, the what happened in history and how it is interpreted uh, often, often differ. And uh, depending on your point of view or when you are making a judgment, well, you might come to conclusions which completely mis, uh, misrepresent what actually happened. I am not going to compare Spring versus Java E. This is definitely not my goal. Uh, what I will tell you that, uh, first of all, there is something called uh, micro profile, which is an evolution of Java, uh, Java EE. And uh, some people say that happened because Spring was too complex. Another reason was because other technologies and how we started uh, and, 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 and how we actually ended up building software uh, has moved on. Nobody or almost nobody is using EGB anymore. So them being part of the spec, actually, they don't matter that much. Uh, the good thing is microprofile is a thing that's actively developed. And there is a multitude of presentations that involve microprofile. And they will mention them uh, during this uh, J Champions Conf. And uh, I see a comment from Kirk that history of EJB is wrong on Wikipedia. It wasn't just IBM. There were several companies involved. Uh, uh, so if you have questions about EJB, uh, Kirk is, uh, looks definitely like uh, a source of authority that I don't remember. And I do not even claim to remember. Uh, I just used Wikipedia because it was out there. But the thing that I wanted to get out of this short uh, trip down the history lane is what makes a software service modern is that there is a general trend that's called simplicity. That's something that uh, is evident. And we make one solution as a response to the previous one. And we try to prioritize simplicity. We learn uh, where in the, in, in the previous approach, in the previous attitude, we have failed to deliver simplicity. And we have allowed complexity to kick in and, and basically encroach us. And uh, we want to compare that again with, with simplicity. So simplicity when it comes to stack. How simple can you make Hello World in Java? Well, this used to be a much, uh, much longer, much more verbose uh, question. Uh, a couple of years ago. Right now, uh, I took uh, three uh, thing, three frameworks, three micro frameworks, somebody could say, uh, that uh, 
allow to make uh, simple uh, REST endpoints uh, all in Java or in any JVM language, actually, and, and compare what it takes to, to have a Hello World-like endpoint. As in, uh, whether it says uh, Hello Poznan and whether it says uh, just World or Hello World, it doesn't really matter. You can see that uh, they basically end up declaring an endpoint at a specific route, and you come up with a response with, with, with a handler, and that's it. One of them is called Spark Java. Nothing to do with the Java, well, with this with the Data Spark library. One of them is called Helidon. One of them is called Javelin. Uh, to give you a bit of context, we uh, in Revolut use Spark for majority of our services. We have begun migrating some of them to, to Javelin. And now, as of today, as in today's uh, well, the, the, the January and to uh, the year 2022, uh, I, my personal favorite is uh, Helidon because it is very actively developed. So if you have to make a choice, if you have to make REST services, I would encourage you to look towards those services because they are simple. Uh, now, obviously, having said that, it would be unfair not to look uh, towards uh, uh, their activity on GitHub. Why? Because, well, for Helidon, you can see plenty of commits, plenty of activity uh, over the past uh, four years. When you look, you, you look at Spark, you can see that there was a lot of activity, but there is slightly less. And this is primarily the reason why we think about migrating out of uh, Spark Java, uh, because their API is, to say almost, uh, to say very similar is an understatement. Uh, somebody here says that Spark and Java, Spark and Javelin are cousins. I do not know uh, their family tree well enough to 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 say whether they actually are cousins. Uh, but any of those frameworks that's simple and that's actively developed as of now, if you need to start uh, a project or Spring Boot or Mike, or, or, or Quarkus or anything else will be a good choice. Don't pick a tool that's not actively developed because then you are maybe not immediately, but later down the line when there are security, well, maybe security, maybe other fixes to be done. If there is nobody supporting it and there is no activity, uh, you're, putting, you're accepting a risk. Now, going on, uh, and as I said, as of today, my personal favorite is Helidon, and this is just my personal favorite. I have not used it as much as I have Spark, it's just what I like the most. Now, the goal that we have in when we are starting those new services or we are already building services is to prevent calcification. I would say prevent calcification maybe almost at all cost. Because how does complexity happen? Complexity happens one commit at a time. And the more magic, the more complexity you have, the more accidental complexity you have in your software, the more workarounds you have, will have to build. And the harder it will be for you to battle this complexity. So. Have you ever approached uh, some any software with, hey, let's build some legacy. Let's immediately start to make it legacy. Uh, I actually heard this uh, phrase uh, walking on a sidewalk uh, in, I think that was San Jose, uh, that some people were uh, adopting the approach of doing the whatever. So this is a quote, this is not my idea. And this basically means, yeah, let's, let's do whatever works. We, we don't really care about how we do it. But I think after, if we are all interested in building modern applications and uh, that are Java-based and they're run in the cloud and uh, you have some either pride or you don't just like working with uh, substandard things, then you're not interested in that approach. So the question is, how can we avoid or how can we make the legacy that we're going to leave uh, less painful to work with? So frameworks. Uh, I already told you the Spring and Hibernate story. Uh, know what you're know the problem that you're going to solve and pick a framework that's going to help you get there without uh, too much magic. Why? Uh, how do you? How can you judge whether that's a, a good one? Uh, I use something called the, the two in the morning test. Imagine it's late. Imagine fun has been had, whatever definition of fun, uh, of fun you want to apply here. And something breaks in the software that is running in production that you are responsible for maintaining. What? can you do? And I can say that uh, there are two kinds of engineers as uh, defined by the problem statement uh, a slide before. Those who have, those who have uh, fixed issues late, late at night, and those of uh, the software engineers that have not, but, but will. Uh, 
if you speak to the people, uh, if you speak to people who have fixed a lot of things in the past and who have uh, fixed a lot of uh, strange bugs, the, you will probably notice uh, a tendency for simplicity. You will see that uh, there is a certain preference to avoid magic in the software because debugging magic at 2 a.m. quickly is hard. The more layers of complexity you have to get through, the harder it becomes. This is probably why the Scala code I write and why I like Java so much is because it's very explicit. You know what's running. And if it's something is breaking, it is easier to reason about usually. So the rule that I apply and the rule that we try to also apply at Revolut, so we, we run it at scale and it, and, it, and it works and it serves us very well, is code running should be visible and code running should be tested. Tested is unsurprising, but visible is potentially surprising to some of you. As in, uh, why? Why do we want to have the visible code? Because we can debug through it. And if we can debug, then we know what's happening. And if something wrong is happening there, then at least you have a control point. If there is everything magically assembled, and uh, then it's hard to reason because knowing about all of the implicit and explicit side effects and, and, and things that you do not know about and discovering about things you do not know about while you have something burning is just not, not a pleasant ex exercise. Uh, we try to be professional about the software we build and how we build it. So the rule that we apply is no magic frameworks. Some, li some list uh, of some no magic or magic uh, free frameworks. As in there has been a thing called Drop Wizard, which has served me in the past very well. I just don't use it anymore. Uh, there, there is Finagol, there is Java, and Helid on Spark Java. List does not claim to go to be complete, correct, nor exhaustive. So there are other uh, th uh, frameworks or libraries that will reduce the amount of magic as opposed to something else. And uh, pick something that you know well. That's definitely a, a very good rule of thumb uh, to apply. Or if you like to speak Latin or if you like exorcist moving, apaga unnecessary complexity. So begone unnecessary complexity. This is what we dislike. Now, uh, how do we do it in Revolut? This is an actual screenshot of an application. Well, some part of that, obviously, uh, that, uh, that we have uh, in Revolut. As in, if you read it, you see what's happening. It is extremely explicit. Reasoning about what happens there is easy which means uh, uh, if you need to change something, you probably can know where, where to jump in. Imagine contrasting that to something that just lists the elements and there is a magic introspector that is going to get through all of the elements of the software possible and uh, try to, uh, tries to assemble it. Should you add something to that introspector or should you do actually write some code that actually hooks something up? And imagine if something happens in tests different than in production. Well, this is obviously a less preferred situation. So we like to be explicit because uh, we at Revolut are building software that has longevity in its sites. So we want to write software. And then if we do not have a reason to change it, it should be easy easy, or reasonably easy to come back to the software a couple of years down the line, just as easy it is to come to a, so to a software written a couple of months ago. Because this means that as we scale the organization and as we build more services, they do not rest so much. And there is, this is not a pun at the language. Uh, quality, well, uh, obviously, uh, write tests. As in, uh, I know that uh, this conference has attracted a lot of people with very varied levels of experience. Uh, what you, uh, most of you, what what most of you already know that the more tests you have, the more the higher internal quality you have, the faster over time it will be to maintain and to add more features into an application. If you at first take a gamble and do not do this, you will have a short-term uh, performance gain in delivering features. And then uh, there is a uh, there is a point after at, at which those two lines cross, and then it becomes harder and harder to fight against uh, those side effects and actually eliminate them or reason about what's happening there and uh, figure out what what is where and, and why. So if you're here, it seems that writing no tests is better. And it actually might be because you're just writing tests and you're just writing production code and, and things look uh, beautifully. But 
some point down the line, and I can I cannot tell you upfront. There is no formula. It might be two months. It might be six months. It might be a year. It might be a year, year and a half uh, down the line. Uh, you will uh, you might discover that uh, you have to rewrite previous parts and figuring out what was there and why it was there. Were the assumptions correct? If you have no framework of reference, you just have the production environment. It's difficult. So this is why we write tests. Conclusion: It is inefficient to build software that immediately needs a rewrite. And if you need a rewrite, then at least have some framework of reference. Now, we also use a constructor-based injection. Uh, some people call it radical. Uh, those of you who have very good attention to detail will call out my typo and joke about it. So yeah, feel free, I'll drink. Now, why do we? Why did we decide to use only constructor-based injection? The answer is uh, very easy. We have nothing in principle against uh, uh, dependency injection frameworks. As in, they are not bad. They are useful tools which solve a problem. What we are, uh, the goal, this very specific goal that we have in mind is we want this calcification that I mentioned and explained before to uh, be harder. If you can put any dependency anywhere without going through a chain of constructors, it is uh, invisible to you whether this makes sense. Whereas if you have to pass, I don't know, a repository to a view, you might at some point ask yourself a question, does this dependency actually ma make sense here? Does it really belong here? Or should I deal with something along the way earlier in the, in the call chain, earlier in the dependency in injection chain, and only at this uh, particular point uh, and uh, in, in time space, should I put uh, the result of a cal calculation rather than the uh, Called, called to a remote service or anything like that. We also like immutability. And for immutability, as uh, I think the trend is quite uh, quite visible, quite popular in right now. As in there are keys, there are data, there are value classes, there are records. Different languages, different approaches, call them differently. The, the gist is the same. Uh, you make objects which have all of the fields set in stone after you've constructed them. Uh, and then you can reason about them because nothing's going to magically change in them. And some people could say, hey, it's it's quite strange that you've put uh, an optional of long as a field. And uh, well, that's, that's a choice because we do not like uh, uh, nulls. So we instead, we want to have the meaningful, uh, there was nothing set uh, for this field. So we will put an empty there rather than having a null. Uh, what you also might have noticed is this guy. The one that says uphold the invariance. When you look at uphold the invariance uh, part, uh, you look and in, into the, the constructor, and the arrow was supposed to have moved, but it didn't. Uh, in the constructor, for owner ID, we'll say check required. For type, we'll say check required. For parent, wa parent wallet ID, we'll say check required. Also, you will notice that we have wallet ID, we have wallet type, we have wallet owner ID. This is uh, somebody could say, hey, but they are all probably UUIDs under the hood. Yes, absolutely, you would be right because they are UUIDs under the hood. The thing is, if I have everything expressed as string, I can compare an owner ID, that is a string, with a wallet ID, with a currency ID, with a maybe, I don't know, with an address because they are all strings and they all compare and the type system actually doesn't see anything wrong with that. Well, but if I introduce types that have a very precise, specific meaning that mean only a wallet ID and or only a wallet owner ID or only a currency type, then comparing a currency type versus a wallet owner ID, it's obviously nonsensical. You don't have to be an expert in the domain to see that probably this is the problem that you're dealing with because you're comparing apples and oranges or uh, Teslas with airplanes or, I don't know, submarines and, and, and supercarriers. Whatever, whatever thing that you like reading about or watching YouTube documentaries about, if they don't belong to the same family, maybe don't compare them. So we like types and we like types that have limited small, uh, small range as well because they help you convey meaning and they help you uphold the invariance because you can verify that an ID works as you expect, that an address verify it works as you expect, and so on and so on. And I also mentioned those checks. Those checks seem uh, a bit over the board for some, but uh, I would say that they are not. Now, uh, the question is obviously, is that are those checks not redundant? Uh, no, uh, because as the system grows, 
the, those checks introduce small amount of stability sprinkle that you put across your system, across every single place in your system, and then you are certain that at least those invariants are upheld because you have checked and you have checked and you have checked time and again. Writing those checks doesn't uh, cost you much. I know it's it feels strange when you look at it, and it could be auto-generated, but uh, the goal is for our system not to be allowed to develop in small creaks and small gaps and small breakages because we just don't. The domain objects have to be properly constructed, which means the next step on top of that is you can trust the domain objects that they will not uh, throw a null pointer or they will not cause something else, which means that if you have to de uh, debug something, the reasoning is easier because there are less implicit things that you have to be aware of or discover because there is much more things that are explicit. Some people here that are more familiar with domain-driven design will notice uh, a pattern that we have applied. And yes, I will say absolutely, this is uh, us applying uh, an element of domain-driven design. And I will mention domain-driven design a bit more, but sadly, because this talk is limited in time, I will not be able to explain everything about domain-driven design that, I'm, uh, that I would love to. Also, soon in Java 17 or in Java 17 already, if you are using that, you can do something like this. Instead of having a, fi a class with final things, you can have just, just have a record. Uh, simplifies the code and also uh, makes uh, your life much easier. Now, I know a lot of people here uh, might, be a no, might be knowledgeable of a thing called Lombok. And Lombok is a useful tool if you know how it works and if you know what are the side effects that it might bring to your software. So as a quiz to the Lombok using community, the question to you here is, uh, how can this code lead to a bug? And I will wait for this to appear in the chat and drink something in the meantime. Hmm, dear chat, no answers. Uh, okay, let's move on. Uh, this might, to some people, look like an immutable data class. As in, there is this setter so that you are uh, very, uh, very, it's, it's been made very visible that it, there, it, it is actually immutable data class, but it's a, somebody might say that this is data and it should be immutable. If you put it as a key for a hash map and then you mutate the field, then the generated hash code method is going to change its value. And you cannot see it because you have no idea uh, what the hash code method looks like. This is a, an interpretation of a bug, I, uh, one of the many bugs actually, I've had to uh, deal with in my uh, a year in my life, a uh, couple companies passed. So I will not tell you which one. It's it's not Revolut. We do not use Lombok uh, in Revolut, but there are subtle bugs like this that uh, you can make uh, because uh, things are not obvious. Uh, now, if you if you see that, if you compare a uh, Lombok uh, element there with the left or right, where it is impossible to just have anything mutable in here, then you can obviously see what uh, that explicit, no magic, no possibility to make it uh, to make it break is why we prefer it. Uh, I'm not going to say that you should immediately stop using Lombok, but I would only say write tests and make behaviors explicit and be careful if you're using frameworks to generate things for you because if you don't know what's there, if you've never gone into what's actually there to understand what's happening behind the scenes, then you might be surprised by what happens. Now, what about mutability? How should you deal with mutability? Because you have a lot of mutability to deal with your business services, most likely business services. Uh, option number one is just store the mutability in a data store. Take data, a snapshot of data from, from, the, from the data store, treat it as immutable, process it, and then store it back. And and then you're done. Option number two is something called CQRS and event sourcing, which I will not have enough time to cover in this uh, talk as well. So I will just tell you what we do. One thing that we uh, use is Postgres. Why Postgres? Because it's some people could say that's such a dated data store. Everybody knows Postgres. Well, I've used it at my university. I've used it when dinosaurs were the thing that you used to go to school with. Uh, or even before that. Uh, no, not really. Uh, Postgres or any other well-known uh, relational database has the amazing benefit of having a well-understood consistency model, 
and it also has quite a predictable performance model, which means if you have increasing number of customers, number of services, anything else, you know how to deal with that because tools exist and our mental models and our edge case knowledge is already at that level. If you use the latest, greatest, recently announced uh, NoSQL data store, you're taking a risk. If you're aware of your do what you're doing, go ahead. Uh, I will say that uh, Postgres is a very useful data store, especially paired with a tool called uh, Flyway or Liquibase. They both uh, solve a very similar problem, which is uh, applying migrations in a predictable manner. So this is, again, a screenshot from uh, Revolut uh, source code. Uh, we apply those migrations. We store migrations in explicit SQL. There is no ORM-based inference of what the table structure should look like so that we want to be explicit. If there is anything wrong, we can run an, an explain analyze and we can see what happens. Uh, obviously, if you talk about testing and you talk about data stores, there is one thing that I have to make a shout out to. This is test containers. And because I mentioned test containers, I have to make a service announcement. Docker in last year have changed their license. If you're using Docker and if you're a company that ge is generating revenue and you have done nothing about it, you probably should read their terms and conditions and see what you need to do about it. If uh, if you are using Docker in other circumstances, you probably also sh should check the license that you're, you've accepted when clicking on the upgrades, because it might surprise you what has happened. And that is all I'm going to say about Docker. Now, Juke, together with Postgres, instead of using an ORM, like Hibernate or any sort of Batis or anything else, or Eclipse Link or anything else, we are using Juke. Why do we use Juke? Because it is creating very predictable results. The SQL that you get from this query, you can you don't really have to uh, to be a wizard in SQL to, to guess what it's going to look like. And apart from that, if you really want to get the SQL, it's quite easy to, to do. And I can see a question about what are the advantages of uh, Liquibase over Flyway. I am not going to uh, to compare them uh, just because I, I, I've not done a comparison and I've not tried to make a comparison uh, between those two. Uh, we're using it and uh, it works. Both tools seem to solve uh, a sim similar problem. Let's have a, a conversation afterwards if you have specific needs and I can tell you wh whether that actually works out or not. But Juke gives you, uh, coming back to the subject, Juke gives, give, gives you the ability of uh, having some sort of uh, type system help because it uses generated classes and uh, then generating SQL, which means if we need to do an explain analyze to evaluate the performance of a query or somebody tells us that, hey, Postgres is slow, we can actually reason about it. If we need to change anything, we have type system support that will help with it. Uh, it's a good standard and uh, it fits our situation very well uh, because uh, it is simple. And that means that there is nothing exciting happening in the data store. And we're not in the data store evolution business. We're operating as a, as a financial institution, which means data store is one of the invariants that should just work. And if that if doesn't, everybody's worried. But it, it just works for us because we use tools that are taking the exciting element elsewhere. Coming back to our subject, modern versus legacy. The fact is that legacy happens. But also what, what is a fact is that software is read much more often than it's written because obviously you've, you've gone there. And some of you in the chat already have uh, alluded or pointed towards a solution. Domains, domain-driven design, defining areas of responsibility, uh, also the fact that architecture matters. The first layer of stability that you can have for your software is the maintainers. What do I mean by the maintainers? Maintainers interpret it as you build it, you run it. If it breaks, you get to fix it. So direct responsibility, direct uh, line of consequence reasoning, about, uh, of reasoning about consequences in the software that you deal with. So you build it, you run it. If you need to modify infrastructure, what we do, what we in Revolut allow is engineers will just change the infrastructure as code, uh, code and uh, they need to define more containers, change the property. They need to, you need to define more RAM for a container, just do it. Then we will have some people that obviously look at the overall shape and, and, and state of the system. And if, I don't know, uh, something odd is happening, something unlikely is happening, they will notify and ring sometimes the people who are responsible for the services that are experiencing unexpected behavior, but nobody is going to come in, sorts or anything else, 
uh, out and, and fix the bugs for you. Whereas what we have is, is people who watch, look for anomalies, they will triage and report bugs, and then the team that is behind the service is going to fix them because nobody else can will know how to fix a problem with a particular service better than the people who are responsible for that service. Uh, hi, I'm a bit late, just joined. Can anybody brief what's going where? There's a conference and a presentation and I think it's recorded, so you'll be fine. Uh, architecture. What is architecture? That's an age old question in software. Is this architecture? Hmm. Some people say yes, some people say no. I will say it's a pretty picture. I will. I really like the definition that I've uh, copy pasted from Martin Fowler's blog, which is architecture is a shared understanding. So let's take it further. Is this an architecture? Well, I would call this an inventory list. So not yet. So architecture is a shared understanding so that you can reason and you best understand the consequences that affect you. Uh, does this help with reasoning about the consequences and the interactions and everything else? Well, not really. This is a service map. This will tell you where, if you need to build a service, uh, which domain should it be built in? As in, if it is close related to DNE, obviously this should be in in, in, in domain two. And uh, if you want to build this shared understanding, so that you can reason about consequences and then think about what's uh, how you want to develop and evolve specific services or, or area, well. Or, or suites of them even. The question is obviously, how do you convey the knowledge? You do it through documentation. How do you document? What should you do? I don't know what you should do. Do whatever works in your case. What do we do and works very well in our case is uh, a process that's called internally called the technology design review. I know it's a very uh, proudly sounding name. What it means in principle is we have a design review of any major change to any services. Some people, I know some organizations call it a design review as well. Some some teams will call it an architecture review. Some teams will call it an, an RFC. And also uh, what it then generates is documents describing the changes, uh, documenting the questions, documenting the, the issues addressed, documenting the point of view addressed, uh, which create something called an architecture decision log. Architecture decision log is something that if you are not doing that in your organization, this is something. This is a practice that you should probably adopt rather well quicker than later, because this is something that leaves you a trail of decisions and context under which decisions have been taken, which explain why do the services look the way they look? What were we thinking when we chose X? What were we thinking when we decided that Y is better than Zulu? And so on and so on and so on. Uh, this is what we do. And you can say, hey, who writes those? Uh, the answer is very simple. Those engineers in the teams that need to make any changes that uh, warrant an architecture decision uh, review. Why? Why would you do it this way? There is a there is a concept that I actually like when it comes to software. That's calling that's called having a skin in the game. If you if your skin is in the game, if you your time is on the line, you're going to very you're going to adopt a different perspective when it comes to uh, reasoning about the consequences of the software changes that you're going to make. So, who prepares documents for review? Engineers. Who asks questions about them? Engineers. Who has to deal with the consequences? It's also engineers. We do not have architects who would just produce documents and do nothing else with the consequences because that takes people outside of the feedback loop and that's inefficient and that allows modern in the modern services in the clouds to go away because this is how you create unrealistic expectations and you go out from reality and then you are asking for problems. Practical tips, how to diagram us and we, I will recommend two tools or two approaches here or two, two, two concepts here. Uh, how to make diagrams, uh, I will recommend plant UML because it's free, it's open source and it is code based, which means you can store it in GitHub or any other repository of your choice and then it will generate pictures for you. Awesome for us software people. You do not have to buy enterprise architects specifically to generate uh, pictures or to practice architecture. And then you can ask me, okay, but which model of diagrams should you adopt? Uh, do something that works in your case. If you have no idea what to do, start with the C4 model. That's probably uh, the best starting point because they this will give you a framework which you can start from.
Uh, apologies, both of my Macs uh, have just crashed, even the spare one. Uh, what can I do? Uh, well, we're, we're just going to continue. Uh, so we were talking about the C4 model, awesome for documentation, and I, uh, I was answering a question about uh, Rebel with microservices. Yes, that's correct. Uh, one microservice, one data store. For those uh, that uh, need a data store, that's the principle that we, that we apply and follow. Uh, now, if you have multiple services, some of them will not need a data store. I would recommend and encourage you to define interaction patterns that you have within your organization. If the pattern is called RPC, a service A called service B, you know how to deal with that because that's a solved problem. You do it once, you keep doing it in the very same way every single time later. If it's event-based, same story. If it's batch, same story. What do we do in Revolut that actually we've discovered works amazingly well? Instead of services publishing APIs alone, because of most of our software being is in Java or on the JVM, uh, we create clients. So if there is a service called, let's call it Apollo, then to use Apollo, of course you can call the API directly and write it all yourself, but what Apollo maintainers will do is also create an application called Apollo Client, which is uh, exposing the API and exposing the ways of interact with Apollo, uh, the service, so that uh, users can use it successfully. And this way, the client is maintained and uh, any changes to the API are uh, already captured within the client uh, changes because the maintainers will do it. Of course, there are some uh, other clients from other languages that might not adopt those changes immediately, but at least for the majority of users that we have within the organization, the, there is no cost associated with the API surface changing because if the clients are updated, then people have just to uh, apply uh, apply an update to the latest client and they are the, they have everything that's needed. What else is there? Uh, we use event store for distributing events as and if you want to read something about how we do it, uh, two links to the blog. Uh, I'm not going to speak about it because we are running behind time a bit because of my MacBooks crashing. What about monitoring? Kubernetes, cloud native, continuous delivery. First, this is an awesome uh, conference uh, that you're in. There are going to be other talks about those subjects, so listen to them. I'm, I, as I said, I cannot solve all the problems in one talk because uh, life's too short, and the talk is definitely too short. Second thing, some aspects do not matter as much, or you solve them once, but they are not making such a big difference. So solve them once, solve them well, apply the same pattern, and don't spend your creative juices about monitoring unless monitoring is your core business. Solve it well, pick it. No well done tool and, and, and be done with it. Uh, software solves business problems. We are uh, writing software to, so, to solve those problems. And this is where the value of our solutions usually comes in. I will say usually because obviously some of you might work in an area. If you work in the observability space, well, monitoring is what you do as what you deliver as a service. Then the conversation becomes slightly different. But for people who work with uh, let's call them enterprise or business applications, uh, what you care is about it, is, what you care about is enabling the business and enabling uh, building more features, uh, making those features efficient, making those features uh, correct, making them treat the customer uh, well and fair, obviously, and uh, helping other people, maybe mobile engineers, maybe web engineers, build amazing experiences based on top of that. How to capture business reality becomes the next big question. The answer to that is this one. Awesome book. I am not going to explain the concept because I would not have the time. And even then, doing that just in an hour, it would be a tough, uh, tough sell. As in, Alberto certainly must be able to do it. I wouldn't try to. Uh, but recommend the technique called event storming. It's related to the domain-driven design. And spend some time with your business people talking about what you're trying to build, how the domain is constructed, what are the changes, what are the interactions, derive domain-driven uh, design uh, components out of that, and based on that, design the software. Also, there is a concept that uh, I keep repeating that software is a people problem, which means protein-based humans, basically, do not scale very well. As in, you know how uh, easy or difficult it is to recruit for the organizations that you are in. How much time it takes to onboard an engineer, how long it takes to learn what 
is the specificity of the business of the of the services that you are providing uh, what can you do with that uh, well think that in the software that you are dealing with there is enough complexity in the business itself try to op what we try to do is optimize for the long term and reduce surprises reduce unexpected reduce implicit uh, by building quality and resilience in into many places in the software so that things don't break thing, things do not succumb on their own their own weight so that they are simple to understand reason about scale and change when i say scale add more instances or add more features because that should be should be easy and uh, any talk by me would be incomplete without me recommending books which would guide you to more exploration about the subject. Obviously, there is a the classic blue book about domain-driven design, but then there is a very a book that I enjoyed uh, very much that I found uh, recently called Patterns, Principles, and Practices of Domain-Driven Design. I am uh, showing it after the blue book, but because the recommended uh, order of reading will be the blue book and then the red book. Now, having said that, if you have never read, release it, read it. It's an awesome book. Continuous delivery. If you're not practicing that, if you haven't read it, I will recommend it because it's an awesome book. It will challenge your thinking. Hopefully, also change it. Uh, skin in the game that already was mentioned in on one of the slides before, and then predictably irrational. It's it's a what I would refer to as popular science books, but it might challenge your thinking. Uh, when it comes to building distributed systems, which building microservices is inherently uh, connected with, so that you can uh, change how you well think and reason. And with that, I will say, enjoy the conference. And then very soon, I will try to go through the YouTube uh, well questions. And uh, slides, if you want them, uh, it will be my pleasure. Just drop me an email at ags at revolut.com, and I'll, I'll ship the slides back to you. Now we can go through uh, a Q and A session. Uh, before I, uh, while I open YouTube, I can uh, tell you how I get uh, the colors in the ID working as I have them, and the answer is uh, it's an option called semantic coloring within uh, IntelliJ. Uh, given the amount of snacks I spilled on my laptop keyboard, I think my laptop qualifies as protein-based. Uh, well, uh, I haven't spilled anything on my laptop and it still crashes. Uh, GraphQL, PPP of DDD, uh, yes. Uh, happy to hear that you other, uh, that there are other people who enjoyed it. Uh, and nobody reads the blue book. Everybody says they read it. Well, I'm not everybody or nobody. I read the book. Uh, I found it actually quite uh, entertaining when I ran, uh, read it for the first time. And again, video stopped anywhere, and then I don't have the previous history of the chat. But I see, what are the good indicating metrics to refactor a monotic architecture into microservice architecture? Well, that's a complicated uh, question, because uh, what you first need to find uh, is a reason to do that. Uh, if uh, it's not that just you should, uh, there are benefits in monoliths. And there are benefits of microservices. If you're doing a lot of changes in, 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 in the monolith and uh, the compilation time is, is, is long, the integration time is long, it's it's all very, very difficult, uh, complex piece of uh, software. Maybe you can consider that. But if uh, that's a monolithic code base that you visit once in a blue moon or once a month and uh, you just make a small change there, then I probably will leave it as a monolith because dealing with a monolith and cutting that into microservices is difficult and it's a huge effort usually uh, software people i have met and worked with uh, we have all underestimated uh, any re-architecture of a monolith into microservices and there is always additional complexity involved so uh, i am unable to give you a more precise answer uh, right now low memory java frameworks understand that quarkus is one uh, any alternatives it depends on what you define as low memory. Uh, we found uh, the framework usage of memory by uh, even by Spark quite acceptable. As in, how uh, why do I say low memory? Because uh, when we took heap dumps, the, the, the most of the memory was occupied by our business uh, objects and domain area. So uh, uh, that's that. Stop, stop. Sorry uh, about that. Probably the database. Da 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 da. da. Call a 2 a.m. skin in the game engine. <laughs> Lombok did this. Yeah, da 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 
please new stream da 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 okay uh, will uh, when will be the recording available i think quite soon uh what are your thoughts on design patterns in modern java uh they work uh, modern design patterns have been with us for quite some time and they have been useful and people were uh using them for a while so th th those are building blocks that people are going to continue using uh, a question that i think i captured the uh, is dependency injection wrong no absolutely not the tool and the technique is a perfectly valid choice and uh, that's that which technologies have not worked out uh for us uh in in, in that context that will be asin we we were blocked a few times by spock because it uses groovy which takes time to adopt latest uh, java and we have a lot of uh, tests written in spock uh, Lombok, we've discussed that serverless, we've discussed that. I will say thank you. And uh, now, uh, somebody made a comment about uh, me uh, deliberately, deliberately cutting some content out. Yes, uh, that will be a very fair accusation or statement and, or an observation. Because if you look at the agenda of the conference uh, in the days to come, today uh, there is uh, a lot of talks that I will recommend to you. Uh, actually, I can safely say I recommend all of them. Uh, that have the time and have the focus on talking about uh, doing things in the cloud. For example, Rastam's uh, five tips on creating modern cloud native applications. Uh, we want to avoid some overlap. So naturally, you've heard a fraction of the subject. And to get a complete picture of everything related to the area, uh, watch all of the talks. And then uh, you will understand this much, much better, uh, including Jakarta EE. So what's happening with an evolution of Java EE. Uh, Cloud Native by Rastam and Ana Maria. Uh, you also see uh, something about continuous performance regression testing, which is useful that have to deliver performance levels. You'll see uh, something about troubleshooting. You'll see uh, something about querying your code base, which might be useful if you are dealing with uh, code bases that are large or distributed. Uh, upgrading, again, applicable, and again, other talk dedicated to it. So I decided to cut out quite a lot. And then the conference finishes with uh, Kubernetes native Java, uh, which is uh, going to focus as, as the subject suggests uh, by Josh Long. I will recommend you that talk as well. And I will say thank you very much for your attention. Thanks for waiting, those who did. And sorry for the problems. Enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>